So thank you, Ruth. Thank you to the JFN. Good afternoon to everybody in the US, in Europe, and good evening to those here in Israel. Uh, my name is Ariel. I'm a board member of the JFN, and I'm very proud to be associated with this organization. I would also like to thank my co-host and friend, Jude Rekanadi, who I should add is one of Israel's first social advocates and philanthropists in the field of mental health, if not the first one. Um, and thank you to Professor Yossi Ariel Fish, and kudos to him for joining our efforts here today. Um, over the past 15 years as a philanthropist, um, we focused our efforts on two sides of the same spectrum, the building of resilience and well-being on the one hand, and the prevention and treatment of mental illness on the other. Yossi will be focusing on resilience, whilst I would like to share a few words on mental illness. Why is this discussion important? Well, for many years, I would actually argue that it's decades, the philanthropic community has harnessed itself towards capacity building vis-a-vis -vis the development of resilience and well-being, particularly for at-risk populations. We did much less to alleviate the suffering of mental illness. Now, why is this important? Because about half of the people in the United States are estimated to have a diagnosable mental illness at some point in their lives. Whether we're talking about major depressive disorder, trauma, addiction, anxiety, or a host of other mental health conditions, this accounts for more than 160 million people in the United States alone, and millions here in Israel. Now, these are people like you and me. They are people we encounter every day. Those who teach our children, drive the taxes we ride in, and write the books we read. In fact, we may actually be talking about ourselves. And yet, why are we having this discussion now? Well, for two main reasons. The first is that our adolescent children are suffering like never before. Since 2007, there is an unprecedented increase in mental illness markers among adolescents in the Western world, particularly for depression, anxiety, and addiction. Now, there are multiple reasons for this, and I would be happy to elaborate as to why during the small groups. In Israel, there is a nuanced and alarming consequence. The IDF is facing a historic drop in the percentage of eligible adolescents which complete our mandatory military service. This is a strategic threat to the state of Israel. The second reason is the impact of COVID-19. Family gatherings have been postponed and casual outings with friends canceled. Not only has access to treatment and recovery supports become more difficult to access, but physical distancing is also intensifying the existing isolation that is suffering already feel. And in the US, COVID-related unemployment is anticipated to lead to millions more people becoming uninsured, which will make it more difficult for people who are already suffering to access treatment. Historically, the adverse mental health effects of disasters impact more people and last much longer than the actual health effects. Yet despite the universality of this issue, we struggle to talk about it openly or to offer adequate care or resources. Within families and communities, we often remain silenced by a shame that tells us that those with mental illness are somehow less worthy or at fault for their own suffering. Despite the fact that excellent medications and therapies exist, only about half of the people with mental health difficulties will ever get treatment, even people with serious mental illnesses. There are many reasons why people don't get care, including cost and lack of access to qualified providers. But a major reason people don't seek treatment, even when access and funds are available, is stigma. People with mental health difficulties remain among the most stigmatized groups in the world today. People are often worried that if their friends, family, or employees found out, this could mean the end of the relationships and the loss of a job. And these concerns are warranted. In half of American and US states, and also in Israel, admitting to a history of mental illness can lead to a loss of a driver's license, inability to serve on a jury or run for office, or even potentially loss of custody of a child. Instead of treating those facing mental health conditions with the compassion we would offer to someone with a physical injury or illness, we ostracize, we blame, and we condemn. In too many places, support services are non-existent, and those with treatable conditions are criminalized, literally chained up in inhumane conditions, cut off from the rest of society without hope. Mental health currently receives less than 1% of global aid. Domestic financing on prevention, promotion, and treatment is similarly low. At present, every nation in the world is a developing country when it comes to mental health. Such paltry investment is not just bad for individuals, it is destructive for communities and undermines economies. 
mental health conditions cost the world two and a half trillion dollars a year, a figure that's expected to balloon to six trillion dollars by 2030, unless we take action. We can no longer afford to be silenced by stigma or stymied by misguided ideas that portray this condition as a matter of weakness or moral failure. Research shows that there is a four to seven fold return on investment for every dollar spent on treating depression, anxiety and addiction, the most common mental health conditions, making spending on the issue a great investment for both political leaders and employers, in addition to generating savings in the health sector. Now, it's tempting to think that the stigma of mental illness has much improved since the 1950s. Recent research shows that most people still hold inaccurate and stigmatizing stereotypes towards people with mental health difficulties. A majority of the public continues to express an unwillingness to work closely with people with mental health problems, let alone have them move next door or marry into the family. Approximately 60% of people continue to believe that individuals with mental illness are violent. This perception is spurred on by the media's focus on mental illness in the reports of horrible tragedies like school shootings, domestic violence and terrorist attacks. Well, in fact, people with serious mental illness are more likely to fall prey to violence than to commit it. Now, on the screen, you can see the results of a study we conducted to assess stigma in Israel. It shows that whilst 4% of Israelis will be ashamed of a relative suffering from cancer, more than 50% will be ashamed of a relative suffering from mental illness and more than 70% of someone suffering from addiction. Now, it's not just the public who stigmatizes mental illness. People with mental health issues can internalize these toxic attitudes themselves, developing self-stigma. When people with mental illness are afraid of being judged by others or hold such attitudes, this can discourage them from seeking care. Even when people with many mental health conditions do seek treatment, however, they wait on average a decade or more after symptoms first appear. Now, the cruel irony is that most mental health conditions are treatable with appropriate care. Stigma breeds shame and stigma breeds silence. So let's talk about it. Now, during the 1950s, the general wisdom was to avoid talking about mental health issues for fear of making things worse. Now, the truth is just the opposite because talking helps. Treatment often helps. For that, we need to boost our training capacity, our standard of care, implement evidence-based treatments, increase awareness, and shatter the stigma. At present, pandemic fatigue is plaguing our organizations, employees, families, and friends. Regardless of what you're involved with or what you fund, hospitals, schools, community programs, or other NGOs, in 2020, we have endured a global pandemic, a massive economic crisis, and widespread social unrest. Now, layer on top of that, forces that are fundamentally reshaping societies, rapid technological innovation, business model disruption, societal inequality, and workforce automation. And it is clear that an epidemic of mental health has been building, with COVID-19 as the tipping point. This is really a call to action. To effect change, we need the power of philanthropists, of social activists, of you. Now, maybe you're someone who's coping with addiction, or maybe you have a family member who's suffering from depression. Maybe you're a provider looking to improve the care you deliver. Or maybe you're the CEO of a large company who cares about our employees. Maybe you're someone who simply wants to help save lives. Now, no matter who you are, this call to action is for you. So thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussion tonight. Dariel, thank you so much um, for what you share with us. And I want to invite now Professor Yossi Arel Fish. Yossi is the director of the International Research Program on ad adolescent well-being and health in Barla University. He's the founding director of Wellbeing International Addiction Global Advisory Group, a consultant to, the international, to an international organization such as the World Health Organiza Organization, UNESCO, UNICEF, and governments such as Israel, USA, Canada, Norway, Scotland, Serbia, France, Brazil, China, Kenya, Jordan, and the Palestinian Authority. Um, I think it would be fascinating to all of you to hear Yossi. I know this from the prep conversation that we had before. So Yossi. So good evening, everybody. I'm really uh, privileged and honored uh, to be here and um, uh, be invited. Thank you very much for inviting me. 
uh, uh, to, to come and share with you some of our work and our perspective on uh, resiliency and well-being and the effects on uh, mental health, uh, especially during this period of the COVID-19 epidemic, uh, which is causing havoc, which is causing a real uh, uh, significant uh, impact uh, on, on mental health and resiliency and well-being of people around the world. And uh, what I would like to do in the 20 or 25 minutes uh, that I have uh, to talk is to, um, uh, first of all, say a few uh, general introductory uh, remarks about uh, uh, what is mental health and what, what do we mean by resiliency and what do we mean by uh, well-being and make a distinction between them. Uh, although there is some kind of uh, overlap uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the reciprocity effect between those three concepts that you will uh, understand in a minute, uh, I would like to talk about uh, the uh, effects of the pandemic uh, of COVID-19 uh, from a global uh, perspective, uh, how it is affecting uh, nations around the world, what are we learning from the evidence that are coming out uh, from statistics and research that is being done, uh, how do we uh, cope with it in terms of uh, recommendations that come out from the United Nations and from the World Health Organization, and try to uh, look at that very briefly uh, to give that perspective, the global perspective, and the most interesting, the most important uh, uh, realization or insight is uh, universality, the, 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 the fact that the effect of the pandemic is universal in terms of the types of uh, impact it has on uh, different peoples around the world, uh, 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 on their mental health, on resiliency, on their uh, manage to, the, the, the way they can manage to function in their daily life and so on. Uh, and we'll talk about that in, in a minute. But uh, 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 what I would like to say is that um, during the past, um, I would say about a decade, uh, maybe a decade and a half, uh, there was a big revolution, a big, a, big, a big change in the way we are starting to look at uh, uh, health outcomes, uh, uh, patterns of risk behaviors and, and strategies and, and theoretical models that help us understand how they get formed and how uh, we are able to, uh, to, to, to impact change and, and, and improve patterns of risk behaviors, improve mental health uh, and, and different uh, negative outcomes in people's lives, where till about the end of the, the 90s, beginning of, the, of this millennium, most of the, uh, mo most of the models were models of uh, pathology, models that are looking, seeking and looking uh, to find, uh, identify risk factors in the social environment that people live in, uh, children and adolescents and, and, and adults, uh, what are the things that uh, have a negative effect on their life and what, uh, what are those uh, risk factors that are uh, that uh, manage to explain why they uh, develop these negative risk behaviors or they develop mental uh, illness or, or mental, uh, mental symptomatology and so on. And most of the intervention models were focused in the same way, trying to mend, trying to correct these risk factors uh, and, and then uh, uh, trying to uh, make sure that uh, that correction will follow up with an with a improved uh, outcome. Well, uh, at the end of the 90s, I'm, I'm, I'm mainly focused on adolescent and, and young adult health and working with the World Health Organization with research uh, systems that are in, uh, implemented in uh, over 60 countries across the world, 50 of them in uh, Europe. Uh, and and we, we've been uh, following that for, since the beginning of the 90s. And uh, we're looking at the outcomes and suddenly we realized towards the end of the 90s that, that we were not able to significantly change the outcome picture of mental health, of, of symptoms of mental health, of uh, health-related risk behaviors. The, the, the general pattern in most of the countries in the world stayed about the same. Some improvements here and there, and other things, we, uh, uh, it even uh, became worse. And this is despite the fact that over the 30 decades that came before the end of the 90s, uh, we developed theoretical models, we developed new approaches for intervention and prevention. Uh, we, we, we knew how to uh, create coalitions of partners on a local authority level and work together and, 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 and do comprehensive uh, intervention programs. There was a big gap between the amount of uh, work, the amount of knowledge, the amount of very uh, competent and skilled uh, professional people who are doing this work, uh, a big gap between that 
and the test or the uh, examination of the outcome. The outcome didn't change. Uh, so we knew that something is not working as uh, uh, Einstein said that if you do what you did, you get what you got. If we continue to do the same things that we are doing, we won't get better results. So we, we did a meta-analysis at the end of the 19th, beginning of the uh, 2001 too. Uh, we talk about 10,000 uh, research uh, uh, studies in the scientific literature to, to try to put the finger on what are the major uh, determinants that predict uh, risk behaviors and predict mental health and predict uh, achievements in school or, 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 or disachievements in school, a failure in school, and so on and so forth. All these outcomes that we are trying to impact for many, many years in the lives of, uh, of uh, children and youth. And uh, the astonishing outcome of this meta-analysis was that we managed to reduce a field of hundreds and hundreds of what we call independent variables, predictors uh, or determinants, we managed to reduce it to a very, very small uh, number of, of, of predictors or determinants of, of, of risk behavior and mental health. And we even managed to reduce that further after we analyzed uh, the data of 300,000 kids in Europe again and, and tried to pinpoint. And we managed to reduce it to about to four major uh, 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 factors that have the greatest impact on children. And when we looked at the factors, that's when the big revelation came up. Because instead of risk factors like uh, being uh, uh, living in a single parent family or being from a low social economic status, these are sort of chronic conditions, or being exposed to stress or exposed to other uh, risk factors in the social environment, the four major determinants of health and well being and uh, resiliency and risk behavior were not risk factors. All the four of them were protective resiliency factors, things that have to be there in the life of children, in the life of adolescents, in the life of adults, and you know what, the life of all of us. In order for us to wake up in the morning with a smile on our face and be functional and be able to, 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 to take our potential and, and do something with it in a constructive way. And, and the absence of those determinants of those factors in your life is causing the kids to go to these negative places and get infected or affected by uh, negative mental outcomes. So this was an enormous uh, change in the way we think about things. And from that period onwards, there was a, a enormous development in the conceptual frameworks that we're using, in the intervention strategies that we started to develop and implement. And for the first time in history, we became more and more effective in the ability to really uh, create change in the outcomes of mental health, the outcomes of risk behaviors, the outcome of addiction, the outcomes of all these uh, uh, adverse effects and, and, and effect also positive outcomes like positive health, uh, uh, achievements in school uh, uh, and so on. And, and we did that by shifting from moving from focus on risk and pathology and trying to trying to mend it, uh, we moved 180 degrees to the other side and we started to focus on ways to enhance the well-being of children, to enhance their mental and functional well-being, to enhance the resiliency so that the well-being will, will, will be high and a child that his well-being is high is not, he doesn't need to go and look for risk behaviors or look for other types of negative uh, uh, conduct in his life and, and, and his mental health is, is positive and, and functioning. So, so this change is causing a new field. Uh, and in fact, uh, here I come to the definition uh, of these three concepts that we're working with. Uh, I won't go into the scientific definition. I just want to explain so that we will be talking the same language. So when we talk about mental health, uh, there's, there's, uh, we talk about mental health or positive mental, mental health uh, uh, is a term uh, equivalent to health. When we're talking about a person who is healthy, uh, usually the chap, the, the, the simple explanation is a person that doesn't have illness. If he doesn't have any, if he's not ill, so he's healthy. The same goes to mental health. If, if you are not suffering from things that are negatively affecting your mental health and you wake up in the morning with a smile on your face and everything is fine, so your mental health is okay. 
and uh, your positive mental health is okay, but the problem is when the mental health starts uh, suffering from, uh, from uh, anxiety, fear, uh, uh, symptoms of depression, uh, post-traumatic stress, and so on and so forth, uh, 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 that's when we're talking about negative mental health or, or mental illness, if, it, if, it, if it's uh, extreme to the way where the symptomatology is uh, defined already as a, as a specific uh, disorder. Uh, or mental illness. So there's a whole range there. Uh, now, uh, so, so, that, so, so that is mental health. We're looking at mental health as a determinant of, of, of well-being, but we're also looking at it as an outcome and trying to see what is affecting mental health. And of course, the main, uh, uh, the main determinants of mental health is, uh, is, is uh, resiliency and, and, and uh, functionality. So uh, the other term that we are using all the time is resiliency. And now, resiliency, uh, there's many, many models, many, uh, uh, many definitions in the scientific literature, but related to what we are talking about today, uh, resiliency is actually a matrix of defense mechanisms and skills and resources that uh, enable people to cope uh, in face of adversity, when, when, when there's, when, when there's a, a stress, when there's a, a threat, when there's a, a war, when there's a natural disaster and so on, uh, resiliency helps us cope. It also helps people cope in their daily lives with peer pressure, with other uh, temptations, uh, being able to stand in front, in front of a temptation and, and make the right decision. So resiliency has a lot of uh, a matrix of many, many skills that allows people to cope with situations that will leave them in a positive uh, mental health and in positive well-being. Uh, uh, so it's, it's, it's quite a complicated con concept, but, 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 but that's what it's all about. Um, um, the main uh, psychosocial protective factors that are affecting resiliency include things like social support, uh, existing uh, significant others that give you the support of significant adults when it comes to children and youth, uh, social connectedness, sense of belongingness, uh, coping with coping skills, sense of uh, self-worth or sense of self-efficacy. These are the type of things that have an influence uh, on resiliency, uh, just that you'll, you'll, you'll get a, a uh, general picture. Now, well-being is a term that uh, that became embraced by 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 our uh, scientific co uh, multidisciplinary field uh, that that deals with the mental health and health behaviors, uh, uh, and and it became a major concept at the beginning of the millennium. Uh, and it, the, the the definition that I like of what well-being is is the same definition that the World Health Organization defined health 70 years ago when they had to define health to know what they are an organization of. So they had to define health. And the very, very interesting novel at the time definition was, it starts with the words, health is not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. But what is it? It's a total condition of mental, physical, social, and spiritual well-being of a person. This is a very comprehensive, if you wish, a gestalt uh, type of a definition that when you close your eyes and you try to imagine how a person looks like when he has these uh, mental and physical and social and spiritual well-being in his life, you see a person or adolescent that finished, uh, completed his uh, high school standing there with a smile on his face, uh, uh, skills, uh, to do whatever he wants, a whole range of opportunities in front of him, uh, a lot of friends around him, and, and, and his life is, uh, uh, is positive. Uh, so, so this is something that we try to uh, operationalize in a way that it won't only be a theoretical concept, but rather something that we can actually uh, uh, develop an intervention to change it, to enhance it, to, to bring it up. And the results we got from that meta-analysis that pointed out those four, uh, those four uh, protective factors that are affecting uh, mental and, 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 uh, and behavioral health, those are the four markers, the four uh, main resilient factors that, that, around, that, that if they are elevated, they actually enhance the well-being and they create the well-being. And those, those four include things like, there's more than four, but the main four, uh, the, the, the existence of a, a, adult, a significant adult in, in, or a significant other in your life that is there uh, uh, without, without judgmental 
uh, listen, but uh, there with caring and support whenever you need him. Uh, the, the positive uh, school uh, uh, for, for adolescents is positive school. In adults, it's positive uh, work perceptions, uh, a positive daily experience in those frameworks where you are spending many, many hours like school and work. Uh, it's a sense of self-worth. Uh, and self-efficacy, and it's a uh, very healthy social connectedness with your peers and friends. So these are the four major determinants of well-being, but there's many others like meaningfulness, uh, participation uh, in the community, and, and a whole range of determinants that we are using in our intervention process to elevate, to enhance well-being. And the idea is that the minute you manage to enhance the well-being, and the resiliency in people's life, all the adverse effects go down, they get reduced, the risk behaviors go down, the mental health is improving, functionality is improving, and this is what is happening with the new generation of intervention processes and intervention uh, programs. Uh, so this is the good news. Now, how does it relate to the COVID uh, challenges uh, today. So, so let's look a bit uh, at the, uh, at the uh, global perspective. I'll try to be brief on that because there's enormous amount of uh, reports and data and uh, statistics that are going, coming out uh, from the field and I'll try to, to, to make a zoom on it. So, so um, the impact, the, uh, the international perspective is very interesting because for, as all of us know, it's a global epidemic. Uh, many, many countries or most of the countries on the uh, in the world are affected. And as I said before, um, uh, according to the statistics uh, uh, of the United Nations and uh, the World Health Organization, in all of these countries there's a, a, a very significant increase in a whole range of mental outcomes, mental ne negative outcomes, indicating things like uh, 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 increase of 20 to 30 percent in depression uh, and in other, uh, in other related anxiety, mental uh, disorders, loneliness, suicide, ideation, suicides, uh, um, fatal suicides, alcohol consumption, binge drinking, domestic violence, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So, so, so there's a major increase, and that increase is being uh, in, impacted and influenced by the social situations imposed on individual families and societies uh, because of the uh, policy that's trying to cope uh, with, the, with the pandemic. Uh, so so uh, we are seeing this adverse effect across all the countries. The differences between countries are major, uh, 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 in, uh, uh, mainly differences in the severity of the pandemic in that particular. Some countries were hit very severely, other countries were hit uh, uh, less severe. Uh, the policy is according to the severity in terms of the restrictions on daily life. But the most interesting phenomena is uh, universal effects uh, inside the society. The same things have an impact on, uh, on resiliency and well-being and mental health. It's the social isolation, it's a shutdown of frameworks that within those frameworks your life is being supported, uh, 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 you know, whether it's a uh, workplace, schools, entertainment, uh, uh, shopping and so on and so forth, that shutdown and the, uh, and the uh, isolation inside the homes and the loneliness and the social distancing, uh, these have the same effects on people wherever they are and uh, uh, from whatever culture they have. We see exactly the same pattern. The other interesting aspect is that we look inside the society, we find subpopulations at higher risk that are more vulnerable. And the interesting issue is it's the same subpopulations across countries. So it's a senior population, children and adolescents, young parents that have to deal with the economic stress and the family stress and also the children at home uh, uh, and so on and so forth. And some uh, ethnical, ethnic or social economic subpopulations that are disadvantaged that are suffering more than others. So even that pattern is quite similar across the countries. And um, uh, uh, recently the United Nations came out with a policy brief in which the um, uh, 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 summarizing the effects that are known from, from the research. Uh, uh, and one of the interesting things that they came out with uh, is that 93% of the countries, 93% of the countries that were affected by coronavirus are reporting significant disruption in mental health services in the community due to the situation of the pandemic. So at the time where these services are most, most needed, uh, we have major disruption 
of accessibility, of utilization, uh, of, of quality, of, of the type of uh, professional people that can come, come to work and give the, uh, the services that they give, uh, have to adapt to Zoom type uh, 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 treatment and things like that. So uh, a major disruption. Uh, the UN came out with three major recommendations for countries, for nations. One of them is to apply a whole society approach like we say that uh, to nurture a child, you need the entire, uh, 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 the entire village. Um, uh, and that means that we have to build, build coalitions of partners, work together, have same goals, uh, and work uh, in a very uh, comprehensive and, and uh, uh, orderly uh, way. The second recommendation is to ensure a widespread of availability and accessibility and funding of mental health and psychosocial support services. Uh, and the third uh, recommendation was to look ahead to the period when the epidemic will be over and develop uh, sustainable uh, uh, mental health services uh, for the future. So those are the three recommendations. I would like to spend the next uh, eight minutes or so that I have uh, talking about the Israeli society and the main um, uh, challenges that we have as a, as a, as a consequence of the impact uh, of the coronavirus here in Israel. Uh, and and, and uh, uh, we know, we, we talked about already the, the type of things that are happening as a consequence of the social uh, limitations and, and, and uh, restrictions uh, 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 imposed on the society and how they are affecting mental health uh, resiliency and well-being. So it's things like the uh, devastation, in, devastating impact of the school and work shutdowns, the shutdowns of many other things, the corona-related anxiety and fear and exposure to, uh, to infection uh, and so on, home isolation and so on and so far. I won't go uh, through all of it again. Uh, uh, and, and, and we're seeing that uh, uh, these, these situations, these social situations, both on the societal level, both on the community and local authority level, and especially on families and, and individuals and, and youth uh, and children, uh, these effects are, are major. So the consequences, of course, are significant increase in mental disorders uh, uh, and the loneliness and use of alcohol and other, adverse, uh, other addictive substances, increased domestic violence and other exposure to electronic media and addiction to electronic media that we don't even know yet uh, how long this will go on and how to cope with it. We had an enormous problem with addiction uh, to internet before the corona came in. So when the corona came in, it reshuffled the, the pack and, and we, we, we really are puzzled and we don't know how it will look like. Some of the positive aspects we'll take with us to the future, uh, but we will have to uh, deal with a tsunami uh, of, of mental, uh, mental uh, problems, men ne negative mental uh, problems and behavioral problems that are a consequence of, of this impact. So uh, uh, let's talk about what are the major subpopulations uh, that are vulnerable that we know about is of course we talked about and i'm talking about the israeli society uh, we talked about seniors uh, uh, the data shows us from research that 85 percent of the israeli seniors are reporting major significant uh, difficulties that are, uh, are related to social distance the distance from the family not being able to be hugged by the grandchildren uh, the uncertainty uh, in their life, uh, worry about the financial situation of their children and the fear of getting infected. These are the major uh, worries that they have. And 10% of the seniors in Israel are reporting that they lost their will to live under this condition, they would rather uh, die, which is a terrible uh, realization. Children and youth, we are hearing from parents that 30% of the children are experiencing uh, uh, mental uh, distress. Uh, there's a big elevation, a big increase in binge drinking, drunkenness, and, and, and the consumption of alcohol among adolescents. Uh, binge drinking went up from about 8% to 21% among adolescents, which is an enormous increase. And this is after we managed to reduce it uh, in the previous years uh, with very, very hard work. Uh, since 1994 till uh, 2019, the Israeli youth had one of the highest uh, rates of uh, symptoms of depression and suicidal ideation and behavior compared to 50 other countries in Europe. And that high rate stayed the same, flat, 
from 1994 all the way to 2019 with very small fluctuations, meaning that we didn't find a way to reach out and, 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 and make a change and, and, and really reduce uh, this 20% of youth that are experiencing uh, mental difficulties throughout the most valued years of the adolescence. And now came coronavirus is making an even more increase in, the, in, this, in this mental situation, which means that we have a very, very severe uh, uh, situation on hand when it comes to children and adolescents. Um, uh, uh, young, young parents, I talked about it before, but uh, just remember that they have this financial burden, uh, the, the grandparents are not around to help them with the children, the children are stuck at home all the time, uh, the usual frameworks don't exist, so they have to do everything by themselves, uh, 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 which is causing a lot of uh, parental stress, uh, family stress, and even uh, uh, family breakups uh, that are caused by that. Uh, uh, and then there are two very interesting societies uh, that are very vulnerable and at high risk here in Israel. One of them is uh, Arab society uh, because of um, uh, uh, many, many reasons, but uh, one of them is a, a lack of uh, adequate uh, mental health services and, and prevention support. Uh, but the other one is that we have seen uh, the boys, the, the male uh, young people in the Arab society and the male adolescents, uh, for almost 20 years, they have uh, the highest rates of risk behaviors, uh, substance abuse, involvement in uh, youth violence, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, reporting of, of high levels of, of mental stress, uh, mental, uh, uh, mental disorders, uh, compared to all other subpopulations uh, in Israel. And that is causing an enormous concern. And now in the, this period of the COVID-19 uh, epidemic, uh, this situation is, is even getting worse. And we are hearing it from the field. And uh, uh, this is one of the populations that dramatically needs support, needs help, needs a, a building of, of new services, of, of reach out uh, uh, services so that uh, uh, people in that society and especially uh, the, young, uh, the young boys uh, will, will receive the type of support they need in order to elevate their resiliency uh, and their well-being uh, in, in, in a way to reduce some of these uh, things that they are suffering from. So, for example, they, they are 51% of the families in the Arab society uh, were exposed to coronavirus in the, in the wider family, uh, which is an enormous uh, uh, rate. 33% of the boys uh, were reporting uh, poor mental health compared to only about 19% of the Jewish boys, uh, shows, showing you the big gap between the two societies. Uh, the, the, other, the other subpopulation at risk is the Haredi population, the ultra-religious population. Uh, all of us know that they've been suffering, they've been hit very, very severely uh, by the coronavirus. So many, many families uh, have suffered uh, illness or loss. Uh, we also know about the conflict uh, between the more closed and, and traditional society of the Haredi uh, uh, groups, uh, the conflict with the government and with the government regulations and the, uh, the, the problems of compliance uh, that were infected there. Today the situation is slightly better, but I must say in both of those societies, uh, talking and being engaged with their leadership, uh, uh, we know that now it's a window of opportunity because there's a will to participate, to, to, to cooperate and, and to receive help. So uh, maybe that's one of the uh, major things that we have to think about is uh, uh, taking advantage of this window of opportunity and really finding a way uh, to reach out and help these uh, two societies. And uh, um, um, uh, I, I, would like to, I would like to finish with uh, several uh, insights uh, to, to wrap this up. First of all, uh, we really have to know that this pandemic is here to stay uh, quite a long while. It's not going away very soon. Uh, and after it, it's gone, as I said before, it will leave us with a significant long-term effect uh, on individuals and families that will be, uh, that will require uh, sustainable recovery and psychosocial services. Uh, and, and, and we really need to develop these services uh, and these models uh, that are tailored uh, to the culture uh, and the way of life of these particular subpopulations in which we want to go in and be effective. Uh, uh, and the, the, there's a whole list of things that could be done. 
because the time is very short and I actually run out of it, uh, I will just uh, conclude with a message. Uh, actually, two messages. Uh, the first message is, is that there's a, a really a real as as you conclude from what you heard, there's a, a a real vital need for a comprehensive national strategy on resiliency and well-being. Uh, and and if I would uh, be asked to uh, to frame what I would like to see as a call for action uh, coming out from this uh, distinguished, uh, uh, very effective group. Uh, uh, of wonderful people uh, is to embrace the challenge and uh, form a mission uh, to significantly impact the, and promote the resiliency and mental well-being uh, in Israel, or as uh, Ariel likes to uh, call it, well-being now. Uh, and the other thing I want to say is that I'm here, I'm not going anywhere, and I would be very, very happy to, uh, to, to participate in your discussions and to uh, be there as an assistant to, to help you think about more effective ways to uh, get involved and have an impact. So thank you very, very much for inviting me and I'm looking forward to the discussion ahead and to the days ahead that will come. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yossi Toda. And I'm sorry if I was the one that caused you the stress during this uh, last 20, 25 minutes. Um, I, I wish we had more time. It's a, a lot to cover under this topic in the short time that we have. Um, so thank you so much. Unfortunately, we don't have time for Q&A, but we will now have a chance to debrief this, uh, uh, what we, whatever we heard from you in the small groups um, and to process this together. We'll continue to the discussion um, into two small groups uh, led by Ariel and uh, Judra Kanati, um, and then we'll be back um, to hear more from our members. We wanted just to kind of take a minute to bring back one thought or two that came out from our breakout room. And before I do that, I would like to um, introduce Dina Liebman, who is, I mean, she'll bring, she was in my breakout room, so she'll share a thought from our room. She's the Chief Strategy Officer of the Israeli Foundation. And Dina, um, in addition to sharing kind of some uh, a takeaway that we had in our room, which I think was very um, impactful to people that shared about their own empathy and how this ripple effect. Um, Dina will also share with us the strategy of the Israeli Foundation and um, when COVID hit kind of where they were back in March and looking back nine months later, how they took their framework of response, recovery and rebuild and, um, and how they've been working since and some, some things that we can all learn as funders working in this field. Um, so Dina, the Zoom is yours. Yeah. Dana, before you start, can I just add one thing? Um, I think it's important to add that the Israeli Foundation has been one of the flag carriers um, historically now, but supporting mental health um, kind of went against all public stigma and, uh, and pioneered and, and crusaded multiple programs to do with research, dissemination, and you know, prevention of mental health. So um, kudos to you, and I hope you continue with the important work. Well, thank you very much, Ariel, and thank you, Sharon. And and yes, we're we're proud that that uh, in the leadership that we've been able to show and the and the work that we've been able to support in the area of mental health, and really understanding that mental health is health, and it's something that you said, and it's something that you said, Professor Harrell Fish, that 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 building of resilience and understanding of mental health is uh, is crucial. Um, as, as, as looking at the whole person. Um, in our group, we talked about a few different things and, and I think that they're, they're good segues. Everything that we've heard I, so far today are good segues into, into some of what I wanna share with you about the Israeli Foundation's approach over the last, I can't believe, nine months. Um, uh, and so uh, there was the idea that um, Jude was speaking about how um, working with the populations that, um, that her foundations have already been working with, but adding a mental health element to the dialogue, to the funding, and making sure that that's um, important on people's radar screen. And I think that was highlighted in its importance um, by the experiences that members of our breakout group shared that when they spoke to the leadership in um, uh, organizations that they provide funding to and asked about the well-being of the leadership and of the staff, um, the focus was very quickly shifted on, oh, no, no, we're fine. We're here to help others. 
And well, I think that that feature of helping others is perhaps an area of strength that we all take as funders and as philanthropists is something that I know it has fulfilled me over the last nine months that at least I feel like I'm doing something um, that in and of itself isn't, um, isn't the end of a healthy conversation. It probably isn't the beginning of a healthy conversation. And so that that's an important thing that we uh, should be looking at. Uh, the concept of resilience is something that we actually talk about a lot at the Azraeli Foundation because mental health is um, very much on our radar screen. We're very interested in brain science and resilience and brain science um, because we work um, with Holocaust survivors who often have a story of resilience as part of the story that they carry forward as survivors. Um, and we talk about, uh, there's the model of resilience that, that talks about a resilient individual is like a twig with a fresh green living core that when twisted out of shape, it bends but doesn't break. And I think that that was the, the model that we used when we thought about how we conceptualized how we were approaching our model of funding, but is also a model that we're trying to apply not just to resilience among individuals, but the resilience of a community as a whole. And what are the elements that need to be supported in a community as a whole to develop resilience on all of the levels that then have impact on the individual, from the systemic down to the individual, um, the way I was taught in social work school, from the macro to the micro. Um, and so the very first thing we did is the same thing that we all, I think, did, which was immediate crisis response. And that was our response phase. What I think in this, in this idea of mental health and what we did um, was, we sent out a communication to all of our grantees, present and past, the ones who we, we weren't still funding, within the first couple days of lockdown, which is a, an extra challenge in Canada when everything has to go in two languages, so there was translation that had to happen. But within two days, we got out a letter to everybody where we guaranteed for them that the funding commitments that we had made for 2020 and beyond were firm. They weren't going anywhere. And in fact, they were firm recognizing that deliverables, outcomes, programs were all going to be affected. And that our measures were going to change. We were going to work directly with people. And that was really addressing that what was the number one thing on everybody's mind at that time was uncertainty. And so providing a level of certainty to people and opening a door for dialogue we felt was an important part of being responsive to the difficulty of the pandemic. And what ended up happening was that people came back to us and we very quickly started to learn what people needed, which in some cases were what we expected, and in some cases were completely different than what we expected. So we could have said to people, we're here, and one of the things that we're immediately going to do, and I know many people did this, and this is not a criticism. This was one of the approaches that many philanthropists did was we said, we're here. And in fact, we're going to send you the cash that we owe you. So if we've made a commitment between now and the end of the year, and you're in a social service sector, we're giving you the money now. And we actually called all of those agencies and said, we are prepared to release the money in the next week. And in fact, a not insignificant number came back to us and said, in fact, we want to know that we have cash incoming in Q3 and Q4. We don't want the money now. And that was a real learning for us. But it also opened the door that said that we're here in partnership. And so that has really shifted as we moved, it moved into our phases of recovery and rebuild, which we see is our mid and long term strategy that we're really getting input from people about what are the needs on the ground. And it has shifted our model of funding. The Azraeli Foundation was very much a program-based funder. It was not, um, as a rule, um, uh, a funder of general operating. That, that isn't how we have operated. We've um, done a lot more um, open funding than we ever have before. 
Um, but one of the things that we started to hear that was in that realm of the general funding was helped us reconceptualize that whole idea of the role of community. And so looking at things like JCCs, one of our areas of, um, of, of interest and impact is services to individuals with developmental disabilities. And we very quickly started to be responsive to a number of JCCs, one in particular in Toronto, that shifted all of their work with, um, with young adults with developmental disabilities into online. And a key component of their funding request was actually for the core services of the JCC, where the funding model of the JCC, with membership largely predicated on a model of fitness membership, had collapsed. And so if you look at the JCC simply as a gym, right? It's, a, it's got a pool that has a J, then um, what is the purpose of the JCC? Until you flip the community center on its head and really realize that its core functions in serving vulnerable populations, seniors, early childhood, which has enormous impacts on women, which we, who we know have been really adversely affected by the pandemic. Um, its role in helping people with developmental dis with disabilities writ large. And so, in fact, if to run the services of online programming for adults with developmental disabilities, we needed to underwrite the salary of the IT staff person for the JCC, what we were building was resilience for the community. And so that was a real shift in our thinking. And I think the camps come into the same one. And this gets back to what Professor Harold Fish was saying. If you look at those four elements of resilience in adolescence, camp, we've all thought of Jewish camp as important to Jewish identity formation. But if you look at a camp as a place that provides non-judgmental adult role models, peer interaction, a positive learning experience, all of that built in is one of the reasons that camp and Jewish camp and not-for-profit Jewish camps that have always been there for kids, not just at the privileged edge, ed, end of our community, but also scholarship students, that, that camp can be a great equalizer that brings that, those important skills that, we, that we've now learned are really important tools for long-term resilience. The importance of camps become the model of it changes. And I think my time is up. Yeah, thank you so much, Dina. Thank you for, again, being uh, in the forefront of mental health for many, many years, and also for looking at it through a community perspective, which I think is, 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 is very unique how you guys were able to rebuild in that sense. Um, so we had a number of goals for this session. Um, first of all, to really bring the, uh, bring the idea and the notion of resilience and mental health and well-being um, and to have small funder conversations and so that you can walk away with tools that will be able to benefit and impact your giving so that you're able to work with social organizations. But we also want to make sure that everyone leaves today with a little bit of glimpse of hope. Um, so our next speaker is Dvorah Korn. Dvorah herself is a family therapist and she's co-founder of Life Store. And Life Store had for years have been working on empowerment and bringing hope and meaning and quality of life through illness, aging, and life processes. Needless to say that she's had a lot of work in the last nine months, um, but she has the, the small, small, small um, task of bringing hope to all of us so that we could first bring it into ourselves and also into the work and organizations that we support. Vora, thank you. The floor is yours. Thanks to all of you. Um, in fact, after spending the better part of 40 years living with families and facing illness, I think um, I still haven't cracked the nut, but what I do want to say is I think some perspective that I have might offer some guideposts for all of us to not only navigate through, but come out on the other side of COVID-19. Um, all of us who interface in healthcare, physical or mental health, know that there's tremendous darkness, always fear, uncertainty. This is a world we've lived in. But we also know, and not to be happy, but there are really moments of inspiration and revelation. Um, Howie, a 55-year-old grandfather who months before his oldest grandson's bar mitzvah was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And all of a sudden, how he's realizing that not only is he probably not gonna make it to the bar mitzvah, but he probably is never gonna get a hug from this kid again because he's iso isolating and in such high risk. Or Razy, who is an 88 Holocaust survivor who's being supported by one of our hotlines, 
evolved overnight. And she, for years, compartmentalized her trauma, but complained and said, very honestly, the four walls are caving in on me. I can't during this time. And so, you know, we see these and you all have stories. And yet we know that we can call upon that resilience and reveal that inner grit that we all have. Um, in the work that Ben and I, my husband and I, support in Life Stores as funders and founders, we began to realize that hope is actually something real. It's not just a word. Um, some of you might conjure up some image of something that's very unattainable, some dream. We're not talking about that. There's actually models of hope that have been studied, and the one that we've adopted is the one by Rick Snyder, who about over two decades at University of Kansas developed a model that he applied to prisoners, actually even athletes, but never got to the healthcare system. He actually tragically died at a very young age. And this model, which we've been studying and developed into a platform, what we call Hope Demise, actually, um, is something potent. It's a cognitive behavioral process. It can be seen in the brain. We're sponsoring studies with the National Cancer Institute. I'm looking at the hypothalamus. It's something real. And what we see is that hope can be developed in the most dire circumstances. I'm going to oversimplify this, and really, it's not fair. Um, there was a, a great article that we, our, our research on, had published in Lancet. If anybody's interested, it's a great review article that Ben authored um, on the science of hope. And other studies are coming out now. But I'm going to oversimplify, but give you just a, a quick overview of what this is. Hope can thrive, according to Snyder's model, when there are three components that exist, three factors. One are goals, real goals, tangible goals. The second are pathways, in other words, steps that you can get to the goals. And the third is what he calls agency, motivation, something that gets you the drive. Now, that seems simple and actually even simplistic. We all thought it was kind of almost like ridiculous. How could that be studied? There are actually scales that you can study hope. But when you think about it, it's actually pretty profound. When you think about in your own lives, and we've talked about this, you know, how you feel when you're in despair, or zoom out and think about society, organizations. It's not such a simple thing to do when people are struggling in the face of radical change. You know, when we see people, all of us, whose assets have been totally wiped out, there is a need to really deep assess and recalibrate goals. And the critical thinking is not simple to grasp at. So the structure is extremely powerful. It needs to start by really thinking deeply though, because you can't foster meaning if it's not true. And as funders, we know that there are things we like and support, and there are also things that are deep in our passion. Same with the organizational leaders, they have deep passions. It's not always everything that's on the docket list that they feel deeply passionate to. And so this model helps kind of drill down. And when we drill down, we really get to the truest of values and it's transformative and you will see it. Creative processes come about in our businesses and organizations in our lives. I will give you an example, you know, Life Stores programming was all in, in hospitals, in nursing homes, with all the people at high risk. And overnight, things had to change. And these amazing digital platforms, you know, people said you couldn't do it, but if you had to, you did. There was no way when the mission of an organization is supporting the caregivers, health professionals, and people ill, we'd say, well, we're going to wait till the pandemic's over. And so our, the board got together and we sat with the, the, the professional team and the CEO and he said, regroup. They came up with digital platforms that work and you see it, you see it in your agencies, you're seeing it in your businesses. So the restructuring takes, though, this idea of what is that goal. Now, you can't just think about it overnight. It is a process. And we, as funders, need to support our organizations to go through that process. Whether it was the caregivers, you know, how do you support doctors and PPEs who don't know how to say goodbye, tell patients how to say goodbye to family members on the phone? All of these programs were pivoted, lots of deep conversations with the institutions to try to do it overnight. Thousands of volunteers were trained. By the way, there was no budget for it. We're, we're still hoping that's going to work out. But just to use people on furlough, people who were at home and depressed because they were out of work on furlough were mobilized to do phone outreach to people elderly are shutting in, that are shut in. So we're all going to come up with new models and we're all going to need to follow a structure that's true to our goals. But we also need to be bolstered by the support of our communities. And I think this is a great example, our synagogues, our peers. 
I can honestly tell you from experience, and I've been in very dark situations, there's always an opportunity for hope. Just today, somebody said to me, how do I give hope to a, a very old person who's very close to death? I said, what does that person want? Only to sleep. I said, help that person have permission to sleep. If that's their hope, that's a gift. I've been in so many honored places. So to go back to Howie, that young grandfather that I told you about, well, he didn't get to the bar mitzvah. I'm sorry to tell you, but his hope was maintained not only because he coached his grandson that little bit over Zoom, but he created audio files for all of the other grandchildren, the bat mitzvah and the bar mitzvah that are gonna come years to come. And he was in hope till the last day of his life, I'm sure of it. And Razy, the 88 year old Holocaust survivor, she learned how to do Zoom and is reading Harry Potter to children somewhere in the Midwest where her great granddaughter lives. It's a low income community. And once a week she reads Harry Potter and her goal is to finish the series. So we just hope that Rowling doesn't write more in this time because she's gonna be very pressured. I wanna close with one last story about a 27 year old mother. She was an amazing woman, daughter, mother of Julie. Oh, lymphoma was a tough disease. She was in Israel visiting her family and she wound up in the ER at Charid Sedek on a beautiful autumn morning. Um, the doctor said, it's back. And she knew that this was really towards the end. And she started a journey that she knew would be brief. And she had two hopes. One was to become an Israeli citizen to make Aliyah. And the second was to create testimony that Julie would know who this amazing mother was. She was a social worker, she was an amazing woman. And so what did she do for the time that she had left? She created scrapbooks and letters. And Julie would receive now on her birthdays, on her bat mitzvah, on her wedding day, on the first day of first grade, a message. These scrapbooks just came to life when you'd see them. The second thing was, and this was against a lot of resistance from the authorities, both here and other places, and her family, she became a citizen. Nine weeks before she died, in her hand, her skinny, frail hands, she had a Tudat Stehut, an Israeli ID. And even a member of Knesset came to give it to her. And when we talked and we shared the story and she said, you know, I'm in terrible pain. She was on oxygen and she said, you know, this gave me joy. And she said, I don't know, but I think this helped me live a little bit longer. Now we're supporting a lot of studies to see if there's a survival advantage. I don't know if it's going to be proven, but we all know that we need hope. When we're studying survival advantage of women with cancer, we know that the quality of life will be different. And so, you know, on the meta, on the macro, I'm telling you, friends, we're going to do this. We're going to take a deep dive. We're going to know what's really important to us. We're going to get out on the other side. But one thing for sure, we're going to see, we're going to stretch our imaginations and we're going to come up with innovative solutions. And we can't be afraid to fail. And like we heard in the groups, we can't be afraid to be vulnerable. We can't be afraid to be human. We need to move through this individually and collectively collectively because because we will if we know that we can always have hope and i join you in this revolution thanks wow, Devorah. Wow, Devorah. thank you <laughs> thank you so much totally thank you so much really um i posted the articles um of signs of hope in the chat for everyone and also an article um which will hopefully bring us hope um, about the impact of COVID on children. And now to summarize for us um, today's conversation and kind of the behind all of this is Judy Velrekenati, who is the chairperson of the Gandhir Foundation. She has been a social entrepreneur um, for, for many, many years and leading the, the forward on this. So Jude, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for everything. And she's of course the chairperson of Natal, but I assume that everyone that's on this call knows this. Um, thank you, Jude. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dvora. I really enjoyed hearing you speak about hope. It's so important. And, and uh, I must say that uh, I think we covered a lot uh, during this uh, short uh, for the future. And it will be wonderful to know that uh, you are um, with us, that you are interested to hear more. Uh, of course, if you want to ask about uh, possibilities and how to to do it in your organiza organization and your foundations. And I want to remind you that we are going to have uh, um, our uh, JFN conference uh, virtually 
between the 15th to the 17th of March. Hopefully you will join us and the first day will be uh, focusing on uh, resilience um, uh, programming. And uh, I um, hope very much that uh, there will be a continuation to this uh, meeting today. Um, maybe some of you uh, will uh, reflect on what was uh, um, mentioned and uh, um, the conversation was around and uh, we, we will want to have uh, um, thinking how to um, bring it more to your peers in your foundations or, and organizations so this can be developed in the best way for, for the future. I want to thank also uh, on, thank you for coming and staying with us. Some left, but uh, it's very uh, acceptable. And thank you for joining and being with us. And to Reut Stoller and Sharon Dweck, thank you so much for helping us uh, bring this, uh, this evening uh, to what it, uh, it, it is. And I wish you um, Batzlacha in the future. Thank you very much.